Archbishop Philip, it is uh, lovely to see you during lockdown. Uh, I was just, uh, well, first of all, um, how's your lockdown going? Yeah, pretty good. It's good to see you too. Uh, although I feel like I see more of you in lockdown than I do at any other time of the year. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're doing pretty well. So we've, um, as, as you know, we've been, Bunda and I have been in, in isolation for about 30 odd days now because we, we were overseas and we came back and had to self-isolate. So we feel like professionals at one level, um, but looking forward to being able to spend some time actually with the kids. That's the thing we've missed most, to be honest, but we're doing well, doing well. Oh, yeah. Um, it's interesting because we, we were talking on Zoom recently and obviously as our diocese, we uh, are trying to think about how do we be church now in this season of, the, of COVID-19 and particularly how to strengthen our small groups and how to type idea. But we were talking on a, on a completely different topic and we're talking about David and Molly King because yeah. when I, early on when I first became a priest, I used to minister at St Andrews, Rayfordangi Valley, and we had um, David King and Molly King arrive there and, and they were in retirement and, you know, they used to be there and I was, sort of, I suppose, kind of priest in charge really. And, that David and Molly were the I think Molly played the organ. But then I never kind of really realised, I knew that they were close with uh, Archbishop David Moxon, but then you raised them in conversations. Mm. I'd be interested, um, what's your history with, with David and Molly King, legends that they are? Yeah, they are legends. You're absolutely right. Well, so when I came to Taranaki as the, as the first bishop in Taranaki, David was um, the vicar at St Mary's, what was called the Pro Cathedral then in New Plymouth. And Molly was the... Um, education director for St Mary's and look they were a formidable team uh, a, a great combination in all sorts of ways and uh, uh, only about six months before uh, they went into retirement they retired first in New Plymouth and then came down to to Waikanae as you say so um, yeah David really took me under his wing in that first six months and uh, kind of provided a place he was he was kind of uh mr new plymouth in terms of christian identity you know but if, if the taranaki daily news that that organ of investigative journalism uh wanted to uh, uh to do anything about the christian community they they'd go to david and uh yeah, I got the sense sometimes that Molly would give him the text and, and David would uh, would tell the story. Um, but he just shifted right out of that space. And whenever he got a phone call from the Daily News or from anyone who wanted, you know, an Anglican presence at something, he'd say, oh, we've, you know, we've got a bishop now. Here's, here's Bishop Philip. And he was incredibly generous. And the pair of them, uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, came to love and respect them enormously. Um, but one of the things, and this is what we were talking about, was um, you know, I couldn't believe how vibrant um, St Mary's was. Because I came from Dunedin and everything was about really kind of small, small churches uh, in Dunedin. And here was this I mean, congregation that regularly on a, on a Sunday would be up over 300 at the main service and well over 100, 120, 130 at the 8 o'clock. Uh, and... You know, I when I drilled down into that, the more I got to know the community, I came to realise that it was a, um, a a structure that they had put in place, which was called the Passionist Family Group movement, uh, and yeah, that's what we were talking about, wasn't it? And 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 it was just the sense that um, uh, the whole the whole parish, this you know, four hundred uh, people on a Sunday. Um, the vast majority of them belonged to small groups that were part of um, kind of larger groups that then made up the whole parish. So I think there were about five of these family uh, passionist family groups, and then within those 70 people or so, they, they were broken down into smaller groups. Uh, and that was the, that was the heart of, of that community. And what, I mean, what did though, it's amazing that there were so many people here. Yeah broken into so many small groups. So what was the nature of those small groups, you reckon? Well, it seems to me, from, from what I could see, and uh, I mean, perhaps one of the things we should touch on is just, you know, what I'm still seeing as a result of, of those groups. But um, what, I, what I picked up then, and, you know, I'm interested that the Passionist Family Movement is still apparently very strong in New Zealand and uh, in the Catholic community largely. But it seemed to have a number of things. Yes, <clears throat> yes it was about 
providing a family environment. So <clears throat> the small groups were made up of, <clears throat> excuse me, individuals. They were made up of couples. They were made up of families, perhaps with, with young children, families with teenagers. They were really mixed, yeah. each of those small groups. And across the, the larger um, family group, uh, which seemed to be named for, it looked as though there were always kind of like a couple of couples who would be leading this group of 70. And so it would be known as the Smith's family group or whatever. Um, and then within within that larger group, you had these these smaller, more intimate groups, and they seemed to they seemed to support each other. Um, they they were there when when there was need. Um, they were the extended family for people who didn't have an extended family. Um, they prayed together. They um, uh, they they seemed to um, intergenerationally break open scripture together to to explore what it meant to be a follower of Jesus together and. One of the other characteristics of the group, my sense was that they were, there was no silly question, you know, there was no, and there was no stupid answer. <laughs> it was like, oh, okay, um, if that's, so that's how you see that. That's, that's interesting. And, and people were encouraged in, in the journey um, in, a, in a very um, generous, loving, evocative way. Um, but it didn't mean they didn't, um, avoid the hard questions because when I looked at some of the material particularly that Molly had produced uh, for the groups to look at um, some of the questions they were exploring were some of the really hard issues of of the time this is 25 years ago I'm talking about yeah so I'm, I'm interested like part of my activist is activism sort of each things wow well, yeah but you know it was a group of people sitting around supporting each other but you know what about did they actually make any difference in their neighborhoods or in the Community. Yeah, and, and I think the answer to that, from what I've observed, is that that it varied. So, like some some groups, that kind of was a bit like their their raison, their raison d'etre. They they were very activist. Um, one of the things that helped to form them, to give them a focus, was you know what can we do to contribute to well being in our community. Um, that wasn't true for all of the groups, but it did seem to be true for more than half of them. So it was obviously a factor. Um, but what I, uh, I mean, maybe jumping to kind of what I see now, because, you know, we went through a period at St. Mary's where there was quite an intentional deconstruction of that process um, and, and an effort, I think, to be more explicitly um, challenging about, you know, have you given your life to Jesus? Um, and the Passionist Family Group was seen as being perhaps just a little bit too nuanced uh, not not sort of specific enough, not challenging enough around around personal commitment. But what 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 I saw was a you know a not so gradual decline in participation in the life of the parish over that over that period with that change. But what I still see now is that the people um, who were um, young, who perhaps got married. Um, sort of immediately after David and, and Molly left, so they're now kind of well into late middle age. Um, they're still involved in the parish, and they are the leaders who who are actually giving very sacrificially of their time and their energy, and they're the ones who have this big vision, you know, particularly around the peace and reconciliation um, kaupapa, um, which has become so important at St Mary's. They're the ones who are who are still there at its heart. It's interesting, and thank you so much for your time. It's a bit like, it reminds me of that parable that somebody once said about a mustard seed, you know, these little small groups, and then, you know, 25 years down, you see this tree of the legacy of, of that. So um, thank you for sharing that, and uh, blessings on your whanau in lockdown. Uh, thank you. Your, yours too. Hey, just tell me, whereabouts do you get that mustard seed um, motif from? Is it, can you point uh, me to I'm that? I'm not sure. Um, I can't quite remember. It might have been, um, yeah, maybe I picked it up one day reading The Listener. can't remember. It's somewhere around there. Okay. Well, if you, if you can find out where sometime, just let me know, all right? Okay. Take care.